Yeah, hello. Uh, so I'm here to give you Island Aura updates. Uh, we're kind of going to give you an overview of the current state of the software and where, where we've gotten to, and then us, what the current state is of the community and the organization that's standing behind that software. Uh, so as noted, I'm Melissa Inez. I'm the project and community manager with the Island Aura Foundation, and I'm joined today by, I'll let him introduce himself since he's unmuted. Oh, muting, unmuting would help. Hi, I'm Danny Lamb, the technical lead for the Island Aura Foundation. All right, so I guess I'm taking over for the next few slides. So what is Island Aura? Good question. We'll go over a basic overview of it, what it is, uh, you know, technically speaking from a software point of view. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so at face value, uh, Islandora is Drupal plus Fedora. And so this harkens back many years ago when uh, Mark Leggett, the university librarian at uh, UPI, um, decided to, he wanted to use Fedora, but then he wanted a better front end for it. I believe this is Fedora 2 that he was uh, checking out. And so the idea was that there was actually going to be many different front ends for Fedora, like there'd be a Drupal front end and there'd be like a Joomla front end and there'd be like a WordPress front end. Um, and Drupal is really the only one that got finished and stuck. Um, so that's, that's what we have. It was, it was a good idea, but it ended up just being just Drupal plus Fedora. Um, but again, I say that that's, I'd be remiss to say it is just that. There is actually quite a bit more um, to it all. So uh, we like to use food metaphors to describe uh, Islandora and our previous version, which is the version that had a lot of uptake that we have to migrate a lot of people into the new version. We used to describe that as a cheeseburger. So uh, Drupal was the top bun, Fedora was the bottom bun, and Islandora was sort of like the stuff in between. Um, and a cheeseburger is not only a very relatable uh, food metaphor, but it's also actually a pretty good uh, analogy for, for how the stack uh, works and scales. Essentially, it's a very vertically scalable stack. Um, when you're running it, uh, it's hard to break apart into, into multiple servers. And when you do, you really just got to give it a bigger, um, beefier, if you don't mind the pun, um, server to get it going. So, so small but larger servers is really how it ran. Um, when we made the move to Drupal 8 and to Fedora 4, or modern contemporary Fedora, um, you know, the changes from Drupal 7 to 8 were very massive and backwards breaking. Um, the changes from 3 to 4 were quite significant in Fedora. Um, and so we really decided to just take our time, um, re-architect everything from the ground up and try to build something that's uh, maybe uh, as delicious as a cheeseburger, but not as sloppy. <laughs> And so um, what we ended up doing was breaking everything apart, decoupling everything. Everything now horizontally scales. Each individual piece can be run on its own server. And we've taken that thought, that thread kind of all the way to the finish line here now. And so it's actually Dockerized. So Islandor 8 is like a completely Dockerized repository solution um, that combines you know, Drupal and Fedora. So our metaphor for Islandor 8 is a bento box. So it's a very, neatly, cleanly um, organized software stack. So next slide, please. We'll very quickly go over some of the features. So it does a whole lot more than just um, stuffing your stuff in Fedora, although it certainly does do that. So, um, you know, the biggest thing is that with Drupal, you get essentially, you get a website for free. Uh, you get a website builder for free, really. Um, and we use its, you know, content management functionality in order to actually model um, our content and all that stuff kind of turns, you know, into RDF behind the scenes into JSON LD in particular, and then it winds up in your Fedora. Um, we do a lot of stuff for batch ingesting, uploading, got a lot of stuff around searching. Um, we work with uh, IIIF image servers. Um, you can expose your content with OAI PMH. And so there's just, there's a whole smorgasbord of features. It's, it's more than just Drupal plus, plus Fedora, really. So if we go to the next slide, I can give you like the abbreviated, this is like the Cliff's Notes version of the architectural diagram of Islandora. Um, and you know, if you take home one concept from, from this image, it's just that Drupal is really in the center of everything. So 
Um, everything you do, you work with, you're not interacting with Fedora directly, you're interacting with Drupal, um, and then it, all of your stuff makes its way into Fedora. Uh, but Drupal also is what will talk to Solar. Drupal will talk to the Drupal IF image server, right? Um, you will do stuff in Drupal, and then that will end up triggering derivatives to get generated. So then we're talking to Image Magic, we're talking to Tesseract, we're doing stuff like that. Now this um, glosses over a lot of stuff here because like when we're working with those uh, with like Image Magic and Tesseract, Drupal isn't calling out to that directly. It's actually putting a message out onto a queue, and then um, something is reading from that queue and it's actually invoking a microservice. So for all these command line tools to create derivatives with your repository content, we've wrapped all of them up um, as small little web apps and they run on each of their own little Docker containers. And so um, we're just kind of poking them remotely. So what it means is that all of the work is not being done on your Drupal web server. Um, one of the issues we had with Island OS 7 was that if you were ingesting a whole bunch of really large video files or were uh, running you know, OCR on a whole bunch of really large TIFFs, um, and then multiple people are trying to use your site all at the same time, all those resources, you know, they were gone. And since it was vertically scalable, it wasn't something that you could very you know, easily fix, or at least immediately. Um, so, so this was my simplified version. Um, if we wanna go to the next slide, you'll see, this is the real one. Um, this is what it actually looks like, which is a little tough to really, Fit into a slide. Um, big, big props to Bethany Seeger, who's also in the Fedora community here. She actually um, created this and she's the first person to, I think, really tame the architectural diagram of Islandora. Um, we are a lot. It is a full digital repository solution. Um, and so sometimes it's really hard to describe, but essentially here it is. And what you can see is that there's really this kind of front end Drupal. Drupal will end up talking to all of these connectors that are running in Carafe and all the connectors then go and they poke the microservices. So you find that flow going there from Drupal down the green arrows and then kind of over. And then essentially the results that you get from invoking all these microservices, whether it's a, you know, a thumbnail or your extracted text or your fits file or whatever, um, all of that stuff then actually makes its way back into Drupal and back into your repository. Um, so we can go, I guess, next slide. So how do we use Fedora? You can, you can press the button. Thank you. We get the nice animations. Um, so we use it for your storage, smart storage, your files. If you choose to put them in um, Fedora, that is, that is where they go. Um, we also run all of our fixity checks and our auditing against Fedora. Um, Drupal has a concept of revisions, which would be if you were like revisioning a draft of some content, but we go ahead and we take all of those and we convert all of that into um, standard Fedora uh, API compliant mementos for uh, versioning. Um, and then also we're really looking forward um, to OCFL, uh, which we think is a, a, a huge step forward for the software and I think giving the users something that they, they really missed from Fedora 3. So we can kind of have the, the best of both worlds with Fedora 6, I think, coming up. Um, next slide, please. And so really there was in the, the other diagram in the simplified diagram, you saw this little F kind of in between Drupal and Fedora. Um, and what that is is Fly System. So Fly System is a abstraction layer for file systems that's written in PHP. And so really when you ask, how do we use Fedora? Um, the answer is, uh, you know, most simply, it is a file system for Drupal. So Drupal has this concept of public and private file systems and where you can put things. And so we've got all of the appropriate adapters and plugins um, to essentially um, slide Fedora right into this whole ecosystem. So just in the same way that you would use um, your Drupal and you would connect it to something like um, AWS for S3 buckets or like DigitalOcean spaces or I believe Rackspace also has a solution. Just like any of those services, it's all abstracted into the same um, kind of shape. And so we can just like slide a Fedora right in. So when you're going through and you're working in Islandora and you're uploading things and doing stuff, it looks like you're just talking to Drupal. Um, but in reality, when you're uploading all those files, those are actually all getting um, slid right back into, into your preservation layer for you. 
So I guess, I guess that's the end of my kind of technical discussion here and I'll, I'll mute myself. Uh, yeah, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the Island Aura community and the foundation and, and the people that are, are building and maintaining this project. Uh, so this is a very quick look at some of the statistics in the Island Aura community, kind of a snapshot of where we are right now. Um, I'm not going to go through these in detail. We can see we're not huge, um, but it's a good sized open source community for the, for the sphere that we're in. And we have a very active culture of peer support, which is really key to our sustainability, uh, particularly if you look at that bottom number, that two full-time staff, so much like Fedora, there's only two full-time staff equivalents working on this project full-time, which means a lot of this maintenance and development and documentation writing and troubleshooting, all of this has to kind of come from the people who are using the software, working together on it. Uh, another way to look at the Islandor community is, of course, the sites that are using it. We know of at least 320 out there, but uh, much like Fedora, Islandor does not phone home. There's no license. So we strongly suspect there's a lot more folks out there that are kind of quietly using it and they're flying under our radar. But as far as we are aware, there's, uh, there's at least one Islandora site on every continent except Antarctica. Fingers crossed the research station will pick it up someday and we can check all the boxes. Uh, it is mostly picked up in North America and Europe, uh, but it has been spreading uh, a lot of growth. There's our, our latest version in New Zealand, for instance. And uh, another way of looking at our community is the ways in which we're interacting. Um, I think it's particularly important that this, we've got this very complex web. It looks a little intimidating, but it's important that it's complex because to sustain a project like this, we don't just need developers. Islandora is sustained by a really wide variety of skills and contributions, and that's reflected in this complex web of the different ways that our community works together. We've got volunteers over in project governance helping to organize the project and run things. We've got volunteers working together in interest groups, sharing their knowledge and working together on projects around particular topics of interest like institutional repositories or metadata. Uh, we've got volunteers who join us on our releases and they don't just do bug fixes and write code. They're also doing our testing. They're writing the documentation. Um, even when people come together at our face-to-face -face events, they're sharing their work and they're sharing their experience. And that's all part and process of sustaining a project like this. All of this is Islandora. It's not just a software platform. It's a community of users uh, sharing the load of maintaining that software platform. And standing behind that community, there is an organization. Uh, we're the Islandora Foundation. Uh, this is where Danny and I work. So we're a soliciting nonprofit incorporated in Canada. Just like Fedora, we are member supported. So I'd like to have a, a slide giving a shout out to our members. These are the folks who are paying the bills. And this funding allows us to have two staff members. It allows us to put on events and work on special projects when we need to. So uh, those community contributions are incredibly important, but the financial contributions are also very significant for the sustainability of the project. And we'd like to say thank you to all of these organizations. Uh, this is kind of our sleek professional look at our org chart, but I've got my, uh, my diagrams in reverse order from Danny because I prefer to use uh, cute lobsters to explain things whenever possible. So this is my org chart. Um, so as a quick explanation of how the Island Aura Foundation works, we have a board of directors. They concern themselves with the legal and financial concerns of the project. Um, reporting to them, we have the Island Aura Coordinating Committee. They're more of our operational group. They set policies, they design our events, they approve different technological roadmaps and deci decide when we're going to move between major versions and things like that. We have a technical advisory group that works more directly with Danny and they consult on maybe more sticky questions around the technical roadmap. Uh, they'll do things like decide, okay, when are we going to stop supporting a really ancient version of PHP that maybe not many people are left on or when are we gonna look ahead to the next version of Drupal and bigger questions like that. Uh, we also have committers. Uh, we follow the same model as Fedora here, where we have community members who've made significant and sustained contributions to Islandora. Uh, they're recognized with additional authority over the code, basically. These are the folks that review and approve any changes to the Islandora code base. It's all gonna throw through, flow through these people. And there's about 30 of them. And it's, it's a growing group, but it, it is still, it's a core, group of committers who have really dedicated a lot of their time and effort to the project. And then finally, we have me and Danny there, um, little lobsters at our desks, working to support all of these other groups in running Islandora. And we wanted to round out by uh, going over some examples of actual Islandora 8 sites in production. So these are using the not Fedora 3 sites. These are Fedora 4 and 5 sites working with Islandora 8. Uh, we released Islandora 8 last year. 
So most of those 320 sites out there in the world are still Islandora 7 and Fedora 3 and working on their migration path. But there are quite a number who have made the leap up to the latest version or have started with a greenfield. So we're going to look at some of those and what they're doing with the, with the platform. Uh, first up, we have Kent State, Open Access Kent State. This is the first institutional repository out there using Islandora 8. There's a lot of them in 7, but this is the first one in 8. Um, and as a result of them developing their project, they actually built uh, a tool to turn Drupal into an OAI PMH endpoint, which was then incorporated back into the core of Islandora for everyone to use. So that was a really great outcome for the whole community from this one institution's project. And they're also doing something really neat where they're integrating with open journal systems, uh, the widely popular open source journal publishing system. So they're using that for their entire publishing workflow, but then Islandora is the endpoint where they're going to disseminate the results of that publishing workflow. Canterbury Stories here uh, is one of the first Islandora 8 sites that went live. I think it might actually be the first. Uh, and this was born from actually something fairly tragic. Uh, there was a series of fairly devastating earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. And one of the outcomes was highlighting that the cultural heritage collections at the local libraries were fairly vulnerable. So there was, this prompted a move to digitize those collections and get them preserved. And they selected Islandora 8 as the platform. And they're leaning really heavily on um, a lot of the accessibility tools that are built into Drupal that you can just access in Islandora 8 because Islandora 8 is much more Drupal-y than anything we've done before. And they were able to build a site that's fully compliant with New Zealand accessibility rules. Um, one of which is the need to present everything in English and Maori, not just the content, but the whole site interface and navigation. So they're leaning on, again on Drupal tools for that. So this site is fully accessible in both languages. Another multilingual Islandora 8 site. This is another one of the very early ones to adopt and the first one that dealt with uh, paged or sequential content in Islandora 8. Uh, this is a collaboration between the University of Texas at Austin and several Latin American libraries, and they built the Latin American Digital Initiatives Project. Um, so this is in Portuguese, in Spanish, and in English. And again, that's not just content, that's the full interface, which is very important for making sure that these collections are accessible to the communities that actually built the content in the first place. One of the more recent Islandora 8s that's launched, uh, this is also out of New Zealand, uh, Archives Central has taken records from nine councils in New Zealand and they've, migra they've migrated uh, more than 200,000 records at this point out of a legacy system called Kete. And they're using a, a fairly complex metadata model uh, called Records in Context, um, which I guess they're actually one of the first sites to put records in context into production as well. It's been in development for quite a while. So this is not just a, one of the early Island R8 pilots. This is an early records in context pilot as well, bringing all that together. And finally, uh, research data management at UPEI. Uh, the University of Prince Edward Island is where Islandora was born back in 2006, and they are still uh, a core part of the Islandora community. They received a grant to build a, basically to deploy Islandora 8 as a research data management platform and focusing not just on storing the research data at the end of the cycle, but the whole research data life cycle. So there's data management planning tools built in so you can start the whole thing from the get go in this tool. Uh, it's difficult to list out all of the things that they built for this, in fact, because it's quite a robust suite of tools for research data management. But they've got, uh, you can mint DOIs, they integrate with data site, they've got ORCID integration, um, there's virus scanning built into it, some really complex editorial workflows, they've got a, a Bagot microservice, uh, they've got versioning for all the data sets, for all the media in this. Um, so it's a really robust tool. And a lot of that has flowed back into the core of Islandora because it's useful for everybody, not just research data management, but this is a really nice encapsulated, very well documented tool. So for doing research data management with Fedora and Islandora. I think we've managed to leave ourselves a couple of minutes if there's any questions. And if we don't have time for all the questions, uh, please do feel free to contact Danny and I uh, or visit islandora.ca for more information about Islandora. I have, I, chat, so. I have a question. I have a quick question. Can you go back to the Archives Central example? I think I missed what you described. You said the data model. Oh, records and context. Okay, that's what I wanted to write down. I have a question uh, about uh, the current support for different content types. So what 
could you give us a overview of what in the latest version is now supported? You said there was, you know, uh, paged media was something that was sort of added in after the first initial release. Sure. Yeah. So with our first release, I, I, I mean, you know, first off, I'll say we can handle essentially anything if you're willing to live with it as just, it's a file that goes in and it's a file that comes out and you just download it. You know, we call that a binary mm -hmm. um, generically, but we have support as in viewers and other stuff. Um, so we do images, audio, video, um, PDFs, uh, and then, yeah, and you know, like, web images, but then also like, you know, bigger images like TIFFs and JP2s with IIIF and, and stuff like that. Um, and then we also do uh, compound and page content is what we're calling it. So sort of arbitrary nesting of content and records. And then when we say paged content, like that was added in. So we did everything in the first release was just like kind of the single object types. And then in our second release, um, we added the ability to kind of nest them and make that hierarchy. And really, when I say compound and page, the only difference there is that paged content is there's, you know, there's a sequence um, to the children objects, but we can handle pretty much anything that that you throw at us. We're soon to add some support for uh, oral histories, which is, you know, either a video or uh, audio file that also has a, a transcript that goes along with it and we've just got some kind of PRs in flight to be able to, to handle that. But that's what's, that's what's coming up next for us. Is anyone using it for research data? Uh, yes, I mean, the UPI, yeah, the UPI site is, is storing lots of research data with it of, of various types. And that's actually what's led to kind of some innovations that's uh, like essentially the same PRs that we need in order to do, um, like the video file plus the transcript actually it turns out all of that kind of comes from holding all of the uh, research data the from the UPI project. It's kind of they dealt with it modeling wise the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Danny, uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I seem to recall for uh, those of us who've kind of played around with Islandor in the past, I think we played around with it a long time ago. Uh, I think it had a fair amount of, um, it, it was to some degree a, a turnkey operation, if I recall. Um, and uh, I, I see a lot baked into the, uh, in the current architecture, which is great. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of address for those of us who maybe haven't looked at it in a while, what's the level of technical ability that's needed to kind of install and run the latest and also would you have any guidance for those who are interested in in kind of maybe just quickly giving island or a spin what would be the best way to do that so it's a very complicated technical stack i mean you saw the the diagram right like that that can be you know dense is like being nice um and what we try to do and what we've always done is balance between providing something that's very turnkey that you can just pick up and kind of be off the shelf and run with versus something that's being very flexible. And so sometimes those are at odds with each other, right? And you're somewhere on the spectrum between um, kind of bumpers are up, the rails are on, and it's very hand-holding versus uh, I don't want any of that and I want to just go and, and, and do my own thing. If by default, what we kind of give you is the turnkey solution though. And we assume that you're, if you're a power user, then you can go turn off what you want and go do your own thing. So we don't just give you like a blank site. Um, we try to give you a fully, a fully built site from the start. If you want to run it, we have a project called Isle, and that is essentially the Dockerized version of Islandora. This is quickly, um, getting a lot of attention and I'm sure will soon be kind of the de facto way of running Islandora, but there is a project which I will here, I'll type it into the, I'll just type this into the chat, but uh, it's called Isle-DC. And if basically, if you have Docker, you pull that down and then um, in it you run make and it just makes you a fully baked like demo site for you to go kick the tires with and start and start playing with. Um, so there, I put that into the, into the chat. 
Um, and that's, that is hands down the easiest way to do it. It'll pull down all the images from Docker Hub and I'll just kind of get it up and running and, and bootstrap and go. Um, as, as far as managing it from a systems point of view, um, you know, Docker is definitely the way to go there. We had some Ansible scripts and before that it was like some bash scripts and stuff like that. This is definitely the easiest and smoothest way to, to run it from like a, a DevOps um, sysadmin kind of standpoint. But then in order to use Islandora, you know, we, we try to cover up as much as we can and we certainly are, are going to be continuing to make user experience improvements and stuff like that. But our, our goal was to essentially make Islandora 8 as Drupal-y as possible. So the idea is that you're not learning um, some special system or specialized system, like you're learning Islandora in as much as you're learning Drupal. So if you can kind of navigate your way around a Drupal site, and if you're at the point where you know what views are, like if I say that and you know what views are, like you're pretty much golden. Um, you'll be able to navigate and configure the site as you as you need. Um, but but yeah, I'd say that if you want to some basic Docker skills, enough to run something and follow the README, that's what it takes to go check it out and try it. And if you want to become a power user, um, then you need some kind of mild to moderate Drupal skills. It's mild to moderate graphical user interface Drupal skills. We've definitely taken, we've taken as much configuration as humanly possible out of the code and put it into the front end. So it's still got a bit of a learning curve, but it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a librarian, I'm not a developer, but I'm perfectly comfortable like building views and building stuff from scratch. It went, it, it's a lot more accessible than it used to be. Uh, Danny, I have a quick question about um, authorization, authentication. So it was my understanding as Islandora 8 was being built that you could configure your single sign-on and ownership of the objects could be controlled by an external LDAP server. And so that was handled all the way into the Fedora layer. And I've got a follow-on question, which I probably should take offline, and that's about configuring Islandora 8 for a common central Fedora repository, where you could have Islandora 8 running in different instances for different organizations feeding into the one common repository. Ah, okay, no, that's that's great. Um, so, to, so to answer, I guess I'll start with your uh, your first question. So uh, the way authorization or authentication works is that as long as there is some sort of Drupal module that handles that, so there is a Drupal module for LDAP. There's also one for I'm trying to remember what the successor to LDAP is, CAST. Um, as long as you can make those work with whatever your SSO server is, then everything else will flow through all the way down. So as like a, and I don't want to get too technical, but as like an intermediate step in the middle there, um, Drupal is pumping out these kind of encoded tokens called JWTs. And in them, it's got like your username and like what role you have in Drupal and stuff like that. And it's all kind of baked into it. So it's like your SSO talk to Drupal we'll pump out those tokens that have everything in it and then the system kind of we know who is doing what as they're you know editing and updating content so that's getting encoded in logs and it's getting encoded with the objects that get stored in the fedora repository yes so yeah, if you, you had another have... consumer you would know who was associated with that object and who had a right to access it Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we made sure that we could do that as we went through because being able to kind of pin that down is, was important for us. Um, for, for your, your second question. So what you're talking about, we've got a word for We got a buzzword for that. We call that multi-tenancy kind of setting up a single Fedora and having multiple Drupal's talk to that Fedora. Um, although certainly multiple any things. Um, and we're working on that. We can very roughly prototype that out right now um, in a not super secure way. So essentially what we do is just 
Um, Drupal has this ability to do things called multi-sites. It's like you're running many Drupals in one. Um, mm -hmm. And so we can hook up each of those multi-sites will be given essentially a subtree within the Fedora repository. Um, and where we're at now is we have to lock down those subtrees so that people can't see things between the sites that they shouldn't. Uh, so but, that's a little different than what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of a decoupled repository where you have multiple heads and let's say some of them are Islandora and some of them aren't. But they're just putting content into that repository, but then they could all also consume from that repository. I thought Islandora 8 is decoupled in a way that you know, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing to say that another custom site couldn't read Islandora objects out of that repository. Is that correct? Oh, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, okay. you have to have some understanding of, of what's in your repository. Sure. But we don't, yeah. Any, anything else can pull and read from your Fedora. And if you insert content from something else into Fedora, there's, there's like a small step that you would have to do to get that to show up in Drupal, but it's very feasible. It's a trick, we call it quote unquote migrating in place. But essentially yeah. if your stuff is in there, then all Drupal needs to be made aware of is you just need to go tell it to make a record in a database. It's like kind of like a five line little loop. And That's great, so, thank you. Yeah. Good, good questions. I, got, I like questions I got answers to. It's good stuff. <laughs>